In Psalm chapter 1, David writes, and I'll read it. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So I want to stop right there. Because I think one of the things that can happen with everything that's going on is this. We can be tempted in the days that we live and the stuff that we're going through to have been walking with the Lord and now we're isolated, we're stuck inside, we're doing stuff we never had to do, we kind of put in positions, and all of a sudden we can begin to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We can start to say, okay, well, I got so much time on my hands. Yeah, and you start listening to, to all the talking heads and all the different stuff. And you begin to, to give yourself to ungodly counsel, thoughts, ideas. Or, or we sh it says, blessed is the man who doesn't stand in the path of sinners. Entertaining all that kind of stuff long enough. And then eventually getting to that place where you're standing side by side with sinful behavior, sinful tendencies. Because you don't know what to do with your time. Or you then begin to sit in the seat of the scornful. You, st you sit back and you got all the answers and you got it all figured out. And you start judging this side against that side, this Democrat, that Republican. It's Chinese, it's American. You start doing all of that stuff. But what David says in this psalm, he says, Blessed is the man who doesn't do all those things. David says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the godly. David says, Blessed is the man who does not stand in the path of the sinner or sit in the seat of the scornful. In fact, what's interesting, what David says, the, all, you know, almost the complete opposite, he says, but what the, what the godly man does, and we're going to see how he bears fruit, it says, but, the, but his delight, in verse 2 of Psalm chapter 1, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So rather than being tied up in, in what's going on in politics and who's trying to get over on that one and what's this going on and, and I know it was this conspiracy or that thing and all this kind of stuff. As the children of God that we establish, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a son of the Most High God, what our delight should be is in Jesus Himself, His presence and His Word. The law of the Lord. It says that in His law He meditates day and night. That means throughout the day, through the course of the morning, throughout the day, all through the night. The word meditates there, and I was joking with Yared earlier today. The word meditate actually means ponder by talking to himself. I said I used to ponder by talking to myself before I knew the Lord. Out loud, answering my own questions. Because I was nuts. But now, you have the law of the Lord in your heart. The Word of God rooted in our hearts. And so instead of getting it over to all of those things and all the stuff that causes fear and all the things that cause us to, to, to sway in this world like waves being tossed to and fro in the ocean, as the children of God, it says, but His delight, the blessed man, His delight's in the law of the Lord. What are you delighted? We've been locked in for... <laughs> two weeks 20 days where's your delight I'm excited for this because if your delight's in Facebook and Yara gets this thing up on Facebook hopefully it challenges you if your delight is in screaming left or right politics and, and, and judging everybody I hope this gets to you but the blessed man, what he does, is he delights himself in the law of the Lord. And for us as believers, the presence of God, there's nothing more sweet. Nothing more sweet in these days. Even in the best of days, but especially in days like this. The presence of God, the richness of his word, the assurance of his promises. That's where we need to be at in our hearts. And it says, when we are, that guy who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, he, this guy, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. 
Jeremiah says in a different place in Jeremiah 17, you don't have to turn there. <laughs> I will. He says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green. And it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. He says, The heart is deep, deceitful and above all things, above all things, and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? What's most interesting is it's a question, and the Lord answers and said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So that blessed man, you and I, children of God, people walking in the truth and the spirit of God, there's a beautiful promise laid up for us. In these days, we could be like trees planted by rivers of water who bring forth their fruit in season. In Jeremiah, it says that even in the years of drought, he doesn't, he doesn't fear but boast because God will sustain him in that time. It's like, again, the two men who built the house. Both men had to go through storms in the parable. It wasn't like the guy who dug the house deep down on the rock. God said, good job, you built the house really well. I'm not going to send storms your way. It's not what he said. He said, when? Even for the man who did it right. When? The sons and daughters of God, when? The storms come. What are you going to do? How did you dig? It's awful difficult to learn how to swim when you're ready to drown. That's why we have the time right now. We're, we're shut in. How much time do you have? I have so much time. Forgive me, Lord. I don't use it right. To meditate upon the law of the Lord. To put my hope and my trust in Him. To, to lay up those sweet and precious promises that His Word has set out for us. What's interesting about what Jeremiah that I just read, in a year judgment would come to Israel. In one year from him saying that, Israel would be carried away into captivity. Everything would be plundered. They would lose all of it. For 22 years, from Jeremiah being 17 years old, till that point, he cried out to the nation to repent and to turn away. And Jeremiah gets to that place. He, in those first nine verses, he talks about, I think it's the first nine, seven verses, he talks about the judgment that's coming. And then he gets to that place in verse seven about the promise and the assurance for that person who has built the house right, the man who has, who has honored God, who has venerated him in his heart. He'll be like the guy who spreads out his roots by the, by the rivers of water, who bring forth fruit in difficult times. Church, now is the time to bear fruit. Not how we're going to do this. We ain't doing nothing. <laughs> Unless you get the cure, then we can figure something out. But the truth is, we have the eternal answer, Jesus Christ. We have the hope that sustains hope in a lost world. We have the promise that He'll be with us. He said, lo, consider this even to the end of the age. He's with us. He promises. Jesus would later in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 10 say this, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Notice he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Again, as children of God, in, in turbulent times, we can feel like God has forgotten about us. Lord, you said, yes, but he also said there will be difficult times. Lord, you said, if, if my people, right, we all want to quote this verse right now, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways and repent and seek my face and pray, then I'll do this. But he has for us eternally, there's a place set in front of us. 
We can get so distracted thinking that in this world we're going to see this glory and this eternal place. No, there's a new heaven and a new earth where that will take place. This thing's going to roll up like a scroll one day. It could be in the days that we live. I, I, I'm a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe before all the craziness unfolds that we're going to get the, 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 the trump of God, the shout of the voice of the archangel is going to happen in 3, 2, 1, lift off, I'm out of here. That's what I believe. I hope. Doesn't mean that it will. The promise is on the other side of the Jordan. When we pass out of this world, behold, good, faithful servant, enter in, well done, to your rest. There's a place for us. But do we feel like, man, God, what's going on? I can't pay my bills. I don't, I, <laughs> I just saw it. I can't find toilet paper. <laughs> It's crazy. I don't. If anybody knows what that's about, please let me know. But thinking like, Lord, if you're really there, why is this this way? Understand. He says every hair on your head's numbered. Not counted. He doesn't say you have three hundred eighty-three thousand hairs on your head. He says each hair has its own specific number. So when one falls out. He says, there's hair number 246. When another one falls out, he said, there's my brother Yared's dread. That's bundle 260 to 790 hairs. He's got all of them numbered on our head, each one. He said, not even a bird falls out of the sky without him knowing. So if, so if you're wondering, is he there? He's not only there, he's intimate. He hears your cry. He hears your prayers. That's who he is. And, and we only get to know him that way because he's called us his children. The beautiful part, beyond that, and I'll wrap up shortly here, is this other place that we're heading to. And surely we get taste and glimpses of what it could be like. We'll never know. We only see in part. We prophesy in part. We know in part. It says there in the scripture that we look through a glass dimly lit. It's like if you scrape a mayonnaise jar till it's empty and then hold it up to the light and try to look through it. You get some rays of light. You can see some things, but you can't see straight through. That's the world and the age that we live. That's our life right now. We kind of, man, Lord, that looks really cool. I can't wait for that place. Whoa, you might have some cool experiences, but we never will fully taste and fully understand until we get on the other side. My pastor says, then we'll know what eyeballs were made for. Then we'll understand what, what hearing was when we're with the myriads of saints and angels singing around the throne, holy, 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 and we're casting our crowns and falling down. Then we'll understand. Right now, we probably got a lot of questions and a, and a few experiences of like, man, Lord, I can't wait to get to that place. This settled hope, this sure foundation of heaven. But John, the author of John's gospel, is exiled on Patmos in Revelation. And he says this in chapter 21, because again, it's not just an image. We're not just being changed and conformed to his likeness in this world and that because of that we're the children of God and so we're to go about and be representatives of God, but but it's also a destination. There's this place for us. Set apart. Thank gosh. He says there in Revelation 21, he says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So we're not going to fix this ball of dirt. That, that one, this one that we're in is going to pass away. At some point in time, this is all going to pass away. And John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there were no more sea. <clears throat> then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. And John continues to go on there as he describes the city. He says, But I saw no temple in it, in verse 22. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, because of the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut all by day. There shall be no night there. And there shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or cause an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Brothers and sisters, listen. There is a place set in front of us that is not this earth, that is not this place. It isn't a, a patched up or a, a, you know, a used car that we bought and put new parts on to try to pass off as some new thing. There's a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more sickness and no more sorrow and no more death and no more pain and no more tears and no more drug addiction and no more suicide and no more parentless homes and broken children's hearts and things going on that are just insane in this world. There's no more of it. It says the former things have passed away. There's this greater promise in front of us. That should set us on fire. Why wouldn't we want to tell our loved ones? I'm convinced, and this is just me. I don't know, I'm in the flesh, whatever. If they lock us down for like two more weeks, I'm just going to start banging on doors and sharing Christ with people. Because there's just the beauty and the promise of the heaven that's set in front of us. No more sun, no more moon, because the Lamb is its light. It says that he'll be with his people, which is us. You know that longing desire. I travel a lot for work. And I could be gone for like a week, two weeks. And by the second day, and it's not just because I don't like doing laundry. <laughs> but by the second day, I'm like, man, I just, I just want to be with my wife. I just want to get home with my kids. Brothers and sisters, everybody in our hearts, no doubt in these times, we're like, man, if, if there's not that greater yearning of like, man, I just want to get there. Abraham was a man loaded down with silver and gold. It said, it said he never built himself a house here or, or, you know, some big palace that he could have. He was a man of the tent and the tabernacle, looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. That's us. So one... We're the children of God. And because of that, listen, we'll get there as we get into Matthew's gospel when we jump back in. I think it's like Matthew 16. Somewhere right there. But you're the light of the world. The grammar is you alone. There's no other light. Just like we read in the beginning of John's gospel. He was the true light. He gave it to us. There's no other light for anybody in the world. Everybody's going nuts. They're fighting over toilet paper rolls. If it was the last days, and it was about what could you get your hands on, I would be getting chicken and beef. <laughs> They're losing their minds. They don't have light. They don't know what's important. Toilet paper. Important. <laughs> With the children of God. We have the only authentic light to offer the world. We're the salt of the earth. God gives us the ability to preserve and to add flavor. I love that part of my life that I get to personally walk in. I, sometimes people think it's cockiness, and it's not, because the Lord's the Lord. I'm confident of that very fact that he who began a good work in me is going to see it through. I don't have anything in me. I wouldn't save me. I wouldn't have changed me. So for you and I, you're the children of God. 
It's who you are. It's not what you do, it's who you are. And because that's who you are, that should determine what you do. How do we treat these days right now? Are we bringing hope to a broken world and a hopeless world? Not only is that who you are, but there's a place where you're going. All of this will be gone for good. You know that feeling in your heart where you're like, there's got to be something better. Every human feels that way. There's got to be something else. Well, tonight, I'm telling you there is. And it starts in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sin. The promise of eternal life. The filling of the Holy Spirit. The ability to walk in new power and authority. That's the truth. As a side note before we close, Luke chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, I think it's also important for us as, as the body of Christ to consider each other, to consider one another. What's interesting, when the, when the church was first founded in Acts 2, and they had these great waves of exponential growth, everybody kind of just brought what they had and tried to help and make do for other people who didn't have. My conviction, and I'm signing off here, we, we really need to engage those days again as the body of Christ. Not, yes, I go to church and that's my fellowship of believers. Yes, I know Susie, Tom, Joe, and Kevin who sit next to me every Sunday. But do they have need right now? Are you able to provide it? Can you step up under it and do something about it? Because those are the days ahead of us. And that needs to be more real. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and prayer, right? And fellowship. And nobody lacked. Because no man was esteeming, no person was esteeming themselves or their position above anybody else. But each man, according to his ability, gave and had. That's what they did. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for you just filling in the gap for all of us. Lord. Think of how freaked out, Lord, all of us get over this coronavirus, Lord, and you stooped way down and took on this sin virus, God. You bore all of its grotesqueness, Lord. You bore all of its symptoms, God. You bore all of the weight and the penalty and the longevity of it, God. You stepped all the way in and took on all of it, Lord. And in that, you've set us free, Lord. Think of the Bible verse, who the Son sets free is free indeed. So, Father, we for real, we're eternally indebted. And that isn't a burden, that's a joy, God. To call you our Father. Lord, that in the ages to come, somehow you've made us join heirs with you. I don't even get it, Lord. But I thank you, God. I pray, Father, that you would somehow use this, the, the media outlet, Lord, for people to be encouraged, to be emboldened, to receive your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray, Father, for even those who maybe are catching this and don't even know you, Lord, that they would consider and walk in circumspectly, God. Look at the days that we're in and examine their own hearts and if they need to be forgiven for sin. We love you, Lord. We thank you in your name, Jesus.